All right, if you notice the chart up there, we're going to be talking about for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And uh, I found this uh, graphic on the internet and I really like the way it presented it because you know sometimes we talk about, well, I'm better on this side, at least I'm not pushing up daisies or something like that. Somebody might say, I'm on this side of the grass instead of under the grass. But Paul said in, first, or in Philippians 1, that it would be better off for him to be dead. So I want us to think about that as we go into our lesson. And we're going to begin in Philippians chapter 1, and we're actually going to begin in verse number 18, and we'll read through verse 30. Then we'll come back and talk about what Paul said, uh, really focusing on uh, verse number 21. So let's read together Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. What then... Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and thy, therein do I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, uh, I want, the King James Version says, uh, we would translate that, no, I know not, I don't know what I'm going to do. Verse number 23, he says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now let that sink in, especially with the graphic that we had just a moment ago. Verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all, for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Verse 27, notice the change in the thought. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. I want to begin, first of all, by just looking at what Paul said. His sole aim in life was to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And when we say that, obviously we understand that that is to the glorification of the Father because Jesus came to glorify the Father. And so when Paul says, I'm here to glorify Christ, we understand that that brings the proper and honor, uh, the proper honor to God the Father. And so he says, it is my mission in life to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. That was, and I don't want to say sole purpose, but, uh, but in reality, that was his this honor and joy, or honor and glory to Christ. And we would ask the question, can we say the same thing? Can we say the same thing Paul said in this verse? Now let's go back for just a moment and just think about the background, the context of what's going on. And you know as well as I do that if you're going to understand a passage, you need to understand the context. What is Paul talking about? Well, we know that Paul is writing this, uh, some have referred to as a thank you note to the congregation there at Philippi because in his hour of need, they had been 
helpers to him. And he used this occasion to send along a message about you. Believe that everything that Paul writes uh, really is focused on the division that was taking place. And you might just turn over to Philippians chapter 4. And you might just notice that in verse 2, Philippians 4, verse 2, Paul writes, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So there were two sisters in this congregation. Sisters uh, we don't know in the flesh. We know in the Spirit. They were members of the body there at Philippi. And for whatever, to be, whatever reason, these two sisters had, had a fuss, a fight. And they were arguing. And it was causing disunity in the body of Christ. And there's a deep, deep message in that thought. Mm -hmm. Just two people at odds within a congregation can bring disharmony to the entire congregation. Because people are prone to choose sides told the story before uh, one of my instructors uh, went uh, to help a congregation that was having division and he said that when you walk through the door one half of the congregation was over here the other half over here and he said it was divided and he said you could just feel it when you walk through the door the rest of that story is quite humorous you could feel it the division in the congregation started with a family fight and then the whole congregation had divided over that. So uh, when you think about these two ladies and the disharmony that they were bringing in the church, and I've talked about this before, I love names, and you know that euodious means good traveling. It's a good road. And that's the literal meaning of that good road. It's, and I've told y'all this, the book of Exodus, ek in the Greek is out of, odos is a road or a way. So this was the way that God brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. It was called an exodus, a way out, a road out. And so it's the same word except the prefix <coughs> is not ek, which is out of, it's you. EU, which is good. So it's good traveling, good road, good road. And then Syntyche is a wreck. That's a literal meaning of her name. So, so you've got good traveling and then you've got a wreck that comes along. So I don't know if Syntyche is completely to blame in all of this, but her name is very, uh, uh, well, humorous in a way, but also very devastating because it was causing division in the church. So as Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, he's going to, I believe, build the case that this disharmony that was there needed to be resolved, and the way to resolve that harmony is right here in verse number 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If we want to have harmony in the Lord's church, we need to live like Christ. If we live like Christ, there won't be any syntichase. There will be you odious. There will be good traveling, good road. There won't be fussing and fighting. Why? Because Christ had the humility to do what needed to be done. And so as Paul writes this letter to the brethren at Philippi, he tells them in the opening statement of uh, Philippians that uh, there were those that realized in verse number 13 that Paul had been uh, imprisoned for preaching the gospel. He was in bonds, verse number 13, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 14 that many of the brethren in the Lord were waxing confidence by my bonds. See, it had the opposite effect. And by the way, persecution has that aspect to it that we don't expect. Somebody's being persecuted and then people hear about it and they rally around them. And we could even go back in the history of the United States. Started and there were people that were being persecuted. People heard about it and they said, that's not right. 
We're going to stand up. That's what was happening with Paul. People were hearing about him being in prison for preaching the gospel instead of becoming ashamed and bashful. They started preaching even more fervently. Paul says, waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So they had been emboldened by Paul's imprisonment. Was shocked by that. Rome wanted to shut down at this time Christianity. Christianity was not in favor. It's only going to be a couple of hundred years before Christianity so-called becomes the religion of Rome. But at this point, Christianity is despised by the Roman government and they are persecuting those that are Christians. Paul is in prison. The brethren, instead of hiding in caves, become more bold to preach the gospel. I don't think there's any lessons in that for us, y'all. I think there's a lot of lessons in that for us. But now notice verse 15. This is where it gets interesting. He says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So there were those in verse 15 that were preaching the gospel of Christ hoping that Paul's going to get even in more trouble. Envy and strife. They don't, they're not doing it out of a right motive. They're doing it to cause division. But what were they doing? Well, they were preaching Christ. Doctrine. They were preaching Christ, but their motive was wrong. So think about this. It doesn't matter the motive of the speaker. If God's word is preached, you don't know why I preach until I tell you, and then I may be lying, right? I, 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 if I know my heart, I'm doing it out of all the right motives. But we also realize that there are some people that they preach, as Paul would say in Romans 16 and verse 17, because their God is their belly. They're in it for the dollar, and that's why they preach the gospel. Others do it, as Paul said here, to cause envy and strife among the brethren, to cause discord. But then he goes on to say in verse 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So Paul is saying there are some, there were some, associated with the brethren at Philippi that were preaching just hoping that Paul would be even more afflicted. Now, again, we don't have any lessons in that. Have you ever seen someone that someone hates so bad that they will say just about anything to get them in trouble? We're not talking politics right now. We're just talking about what the text says here. There are some that will preach a message just to get somebody else in more trouble. Then he tells us in verse 17, but the other of love. There are some in Philippi that are preaching the truth in love. There are some that are preaching the truth to cause strife, division, envy, and contention. But brethren, Paul says in verse 18, whether it was in pretense or in truth, Christ was being preached. with the wrong motive. Now, how many times have you heard someone say, well, I'm, knowing, I'm never going back to that congregation. Why not? Well, that preacher said something. I didn't like the way he said it. That elder said something in Bible class. I didn't like the way he said it. Didn't like his attitude. Bible class teacher made me mad. I didn't like what he said. Didn't like what his attitude was. Brethren, the motive of the speaker doesn't change the message. Your mailman may not like you very much. <laughs> they still deliver your mail. And you don't get mad, mad, mad at the mailman for the bill that he delivered, or you shouldn't. It's not his fault that he has to deliver that. And so, brethren, the point that I'm trying to get at very clearly, Paul is saying, look, Christ is preached. 
And that's the preeminent thing. Whether somebody's doing it out of a right motive or a wrong motive is not relevant. The message is what's relevant. And brethren, we need to hear that today. People can be doing things out of the wrong motive, but if the message is right, we need to hear the message. So if I get up here and say something, I've got the wrong motive. If I preach the truth, you need to accept the truth. So that's the point that Paul is making in this. But he gets to verse number 20, or excuse me, 21, and he makes this statement, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's examine this. How did Paul do that? I've got three quick things that I want to talk about. The first thing, Paul says, I want to know everything about Jesus Christ. Now you think about that. How am I going to be more Christ-like? Well, the only way to be more Christ-like is to know more about the Christ. And so Paul said, in my life and in my endeavor, I want to be more and more like Christ. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I love this because Paul is the premier gospel preacher and he says in verse number 1 of Philippians 3, finally, and he's got two more chapters. So the message of that is if a preacher says finally, that doesn't mean he's done. <laughs> he says finally as he begins chapter 3 in verse number 1, he says, I want you to rejoice, my brethren, in the Lord. He goes on to say, and I'm going to skim through this, he gives his um, credentials as a Jewish person. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That was Jewish law according to the law of Moses. You know that many times throughout the history of the Jews, they neglected that and they didn't circumcise their boys sometimes at all. Remember how Zipporah was so mad at Moses because he had not circumcised his boys? And so she had to do it herself, called him a bloody man. So there were times in the history of the Israelites, they, they weren't as meticulous as God intended on this rite of circumcision for a young male, eight Paul said, not my parents. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just like the law of Moses said. I would say in did not. They couldn't make that statement. They couldn't say they had been circumcised. Paul said, I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel, verse 5, of the tribe of Benjamin. It's also the tribe of King Saul. Remember, King Saul was a Benjamite. But he is the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's a pretty bold statement. But it's true. People could live blameless under the law of Moses. John the Immerser's parents were blameless in the law. Now that's a rare thing, is it not? But they were blameless at the law. Paul said, I'm blameless according to the law. He says in verse number 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Notice that for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Paul wanted to know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ. Again, we asked this question a moment ago. Can I say the same thing? Can I say that I am so in love with my Savior that my desire is to know everything that I can know? And brethren, that includes all the predictive prophecies that are in the Old Testament that set forth the case that the Messiah was coming. We neglect the Old Testament sometimes, but it has Christ on every page pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And so Paul says, I count everything lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Listen to the language. 
What we're saying is Paul said, I want to know everything I can. I want to learn everything I can about Jesus Christ. To be found in Him, verse 9. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Listen to verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship, the communion of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Brethren, Paul said, I've given up everything so I can know everything about Jesus Christ. That's rare. But brethren, our point is, do we want to know Christ? Look at John 17. I mentioned this a moment ago. But when we talk about knowing everything about Christ, we are in no way neglecting our Heavenly Father. It says in John 17 and verse 3, Jesus Speaking, and this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified, verse number four, Thee on earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. O oh, now and now, O oh, Father, glorify me with Thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. As we think about Paul's statement. How can I say for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? First thing I've got to do is to try to know everything I can about Jesus Christ. About the predictive prophecies, about his life as he lived. The sufferings, remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3? I want to know Him, verse 10, the power of His resurrection. I want to know the fellowship. That word fellowship is communion. I want to take part in the sufferings of Christ. Well, brethren, the only way we can do that is to live as Christ. It's the only way for us to do it. So how do we do this? We need to learn everything we can about Christ. Secondly, and this is in on par with what we just said in verse if I know everything, then I want to imitate everything. I want to imitate everything that Jesus Christ did while he was on this earth. Paul would say it like this, and you know it. We even sing the song sometimes based on this verse. I am crucified, Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You know, it's been often said by gospel preachers that the Bible is its own best commentary. We want to know what Paul meant in Philippians 1 and verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. All you've got to do is look at what he said in Galatians 2.20. To die is gain. I am crucified with Christ. Paul had not literally been crucified with Christ. We know that. He had not even been crucified. We don't know exactly how Paul died. Uh, secular tradition, if I remember correctly, said they chopped off his head in Rome. Peter, they said, was crucified upside down. We don't know all those. That's just what secular history tells us. But I want you to know that Paul lived his life as he said in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, but I continue to live. Now for me, for to me to live is Christ. Paul says, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That means that we're going to do everything we can to imitate Jesus in everything. Paul boldly tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 1. 
1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Follow me? That's mighty bold, folks. But he said, only as I'm following Christ. Not many people can make that statement, can we? Can we honestly say to our friends, our loved ones, our children, if you live like me, you'll be living like Christ. That's scary to me. Scary to me. For to me to live is Christ. So do everything, learn everything we can about Jesus and then do it. And then finally, brethren, tell everybody that we can everything we know about Jesus Christ. I think those three things, brethren, if we think about it and look at it, will help us to know what Paul meant when he said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is vain. My entire life, Paul says, is imitating Jesus Christ, following in the steps of Jesus Christ. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we want to notice what Paul writes. And uh, we're going to zero in on verse 5. And the point is, if I'm going to do what Jesus did, I want to know everything about Him. I want to then imitate Him, and then I want to tell everybody everything that I know about Jesus Christ. So Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. I want you to think about that. And I want you to realize that what Paul is writing to these brethren, he was not preaching himself. And if a preacher is preaching himself, he's not the servant of God. And he's not imitating Christ. Amen. He's not living right. And so Paul said, look, I'm not preaching Paul. And you know, Paul had been accused of that over and over again. The church of Corinth had been divided. I'm a Paul. I'm a Cephas. I'm a Paulus. Paul said, don't you do that. Don't you say you're a follower of me. You're a follower of Christ. And so the church in Acts chapter 5, I want us to notice this. In verse number 42, what were the New Testament saints doing in the early church? And so we want to go to Acts chapter 5, and we want to notice verse number 42. Acts 5 and verse number 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They cease not. Daily they cease not to preach Jesus Christ and to teach Jesus Christ. Brethren, those brethren were so good at what they had done that you remember that as we were looking at Acts chapter 16, those people said that those that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Does, do we have that reputation? Are we turning our world upside down? Not for America, not for politics, for the church, for Jesus Christ. Is that what we're doing? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, and the lesson will be yours. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 28. And I want you to listen carefully to what Paul writes. He talks about in verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now listen to verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom 
that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, whereunto also I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So brethren, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1 and verse 21. How do I do it? I've got to know everything I can about Jesus Christ. I've got to imitate everything I know about Jesus Christ. And then I've got to tell everybody that message. So this evening, I hope as we depart this place, that we can honestly say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I want you to think about that opening slide. And I want you to think about looking from the ground up and seeing your tombstone. <laughs> What's your tombstone going to say? I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, or maybe last week. A sermon that I preached here, it's been years ago, epitaphs that God has written. What's your epitaph going to be? I, I may have to preach that again. What, what is God going to say about us? So this evening, can you honestly say that you're following in the steps of Christ, living the kind of life that brings honor and glory to the Father, and then telling everybody about it? You know the gospel plan of salvation. You know that Jesus taught that we need to believe and be baptized. You know that Paul said in Galatians 3 and verse 27 that as many of us have been baptized into Jesus Christ, we've been baptized into His death. Have you been baptized into the Christ? If not, we're going to sing the invitation song. As one of God's children, if you need prayers, come as we stand and as we sing.